Comedy Cellar podcast, this week featuring free speech advocate and chairman of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, Greg Lukianoff. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Live from the Table. This is Noam Dorman. I'm doing a one-on-one interview with someone who's become kind of a hero of mine Aww. over the years. That's the truth. Greg Lukianoff. Um, you read his, uh, his prepared intro here. Greg Lukianoff is president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression and the co-author, along with Ricky Schlott, of the new book, The Canceling of the American Mind, Cancel Culture Destroys Trust and Threatens Us All. But there is a solution. Welcome, Greg Lukianoff. FIRE used to stand for something else, right? It used to stand for, what was it? The Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Uh, uh, Sorry, in in education. (laughs) Yikes, I've completely converted. Uh, And it was because we were focused on freedom of speech and academic freedom in higher ed. But things got so bad for free speech, both on and off campus in, say, 2020, that we decided we needed to, to expand beyond campus. You know, when I first met you, you know, uh, there's a few people I've met over the years who I was totally taken with, and they've all gone on to become pretty big. <laughs> one, one of them was Harry Enten, who, is now, who I just met when he was a kid, and now he's yeah. a, one of the world's experts. Another one was... Uh, Coleman Hughes, who I actually have, uh, Nico, your uh, one of your guys, uh, actually, actually introduced me to him. Although my, I had, my my protege, my executive vice president, yeah, who I um, but I had actually heard him first on the Sam Harris podcast, and you, who I first um, read, I think in a Wall Street Journal editorial, you wrote about campus speech. Yep, and I invited you to our podcast early on, before you knew John Height, mm-hmm. I believe who was also somebody that I had keyed into, although he was already uh, pretty well known. And I remember saying, this guy's going to replace the ACLU. I remember saying it because the ACLU was just deteriorating before our eyes. And you were the, appeared to be the heir apparent. And that's pretty much, I would say, what has happened. Do, do you feel that you've replaced the ACLU, your organization? Yeah. You know, like we, FIRE has a general rule that we don't uh, fight other nonprofits unless attacked. And I always make the point that we work with the ACLU on cases. They do take a lot of free speech cases to this day. Um, you know, uh, but our, unlike the ACLU, we don't have 18 practice areas. Unlike the ACLU, we're not just about First Amendment law, we're about freedom of speech. Um, so I think we're trying to learn from some of the things that we think, um, you know, diluted some of the ACLU's effectiveness on freedom of speech. And one of those ones, because remember, I interned at the ACLU back in 1999. ACLU, oh, I didn't know that. Northern California. Um, and already, like, the free speech kids were not necessarily, like, the cool kids in the office. Um, but the uh, – and the problem also in that office was that the juice really was with other practice areas. People were much more excited about Michelle Alexander's racial justice project. Um, and even the, you know, some of the lawyers in the ACLU in California, you know, they'd, they'd be arguing what the reasonable standard for harassment related to freedom of speech would be, which is the kind of thing that fires more kind of like, no, if you, 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 it's much better to be entirely focused on one cause rather than spread yourself out. All right, that's a, that's a nice diplomatic answer. In my opinion, <laughs> the ACLU um, does not seem to prioritize the the problematic free speech that used to be what it was known for the, the the defending the people that no one else would defend in order to make the point that only by protecting that do you prevent the slippery slope from attacking all speech at some point or another. I will say, in my new book, Canceling of the American Mind, which I wrote with a 23-year-old wunderkind named Ricky Schlott, she's a journalist at the New York Post, um, I talk about my experiences interning at the ACLU, and, you know, I'm a First Amendment guy. Like, I Mm -hmm. went to law school, I specialized in First Amendment, I went to law school to do First Amendment law. Um, I took every class Stanford offered on the thing. When I ran out of classes, I did six credits on censorship during the Tudor dynasty. This was my bag. Mm-hmm. And then I interned at the ACLU, and on the very first day at the at the lunch, um, I talked about how great it was to work at a place that would even defend, you know, the Nazis at Skokie. And I got dressed down 
by one of the associates there for, um, well, we don't support harassment. I'm like, what What just happened? What, who was talking about harassment? And that was honestly the first real clue that I got that, oh, I didn't realize that harassment had been code for the previous 15 years for an excuse to get at speech you don't like. So, all right, so why a book now on cancel culture? It's a very broad question, I know. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, i got to give a definition of cancel culture. Um, Please. And, and, you know, like I said, been doing this 22 years. Things were already bad on college campuses back in 2020, uh, back, back in 2001. Um, but, man, have they gotten so much worse. And working with this, you know, brilliant young woman, uh, Ricky, I was originally thinking, hey, you know, like uh, Coddling of the American Mind, my book with Jonathan Haidt, um, is disproportionately about – uh, an environment that actually is a disaster for the mental health of Gen Z young women. So the idea, but it's written by two Gen Xers. Um, and I thought, uh, Gen Z, uh, Gen Xer men too. So I thought the the possibility of writing with someone who actually was Gen Z and a, and, and a woman uh, could, uh, could be a great follow-up. But as we were talking about it, I was watching these people still try to claim that cancel culture isn't even real, that it's like a right-wing hoax. And, uh, you know, been working on campus. I watched this with my own eyes and being like, no, that's insane. That is, it, it's callous. It, it, um, it's putting your head in the sand. Like, it, it, the data is not on your side at all. Um, so that's one of the reasons why the opening chapter of the book is actually called The Gaslighting of the American Mind, because uh, be, because I think most of the rest of the public, when you look at the polling, they know what cancel culture is. That's why we called it cancel culture and didn't make up some other name for it. Liberal, Democrat, black, white, they're, they know what it is. They're afraid of it. Um, and the uh, population that is most hostile to cancel culture, by the way, is Gen Z. Like So they, they know what it is, and, and they hate it as well. So I felt it became came down to us, like the ones who had the most data on this stuff, the most experience on it, to be like, okay, once and for all, this thing is real, and it's insane to say otherwise. But what it so? How do you know whether someone's been canceled mm -hmm. or simply properly fired for crossing a reasonable line in some way? We talk about the uh, our definition is the uptick since 2014 of people getting. Punished, deplatformed, fired, expelled for opinion that would be protected by the First Amendment under First Amendment standards. Say, like, uh, we, we try not to get too in the weeds, but like an, an analogy to public employment um, and the culture of fear that has resulted from it. Now, it, if it, if you are, you know, firing someone for their political point of view, uh, we would say that's cancel culture, as far you know, as far as our definition is concerned. One thing I do want people to understand is you can also, since it's a, it, it's a cultural norm thing, we're basically saying we, want, we don't want there to be a law saying that you can't fire people on the basis of the political uh, viewpoint. And by the way, that would be damaging as all get out to, to an organization like FIRE. Because if I discovered that someone on, in my, on my team now hates the First Amendment and they had a law that they could refer to saying, ah, you can't fire me um, because, I, uh, because of the local law, um, uh, it, it, uh, you know, you have to keep me, um, that would be bad for an expressive association. So I don't favor laws making this mandatory. I just want people to, be, to think more carefully about, even if it's private employers, about if you were lived in a country where every corporation, and it started to look like we were headed in this direction, uh, or had already gotten there in 2020 and 2021, where every corporation was not just a widget factory, but also a political shop. Um, and if you disagree with the politics of the boss, you can get fired. Um, that would be something where, yes, they'd have the freedom association to fire them, and I don't think they shouldn't. But I want them to think about what that would mean for democracy. If, yeah, you have a technical First Amendment right, but you can't have a job if you actually have a political opinion. I think that would be very dangerous. And meanwhile, you know, people were seemingly cheering this on in 2020 and 2021 where people were losing their jobs for cracking jokes or sometimes just saying their honest political opinion. So what if you had somebody working for you who's uh, an active Nazi and you find this, and he's he's joined your organization because he wants to make sure that active Nazis uh, uh, are protected. So, uh, do you have any lines that you would draw? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, like it, it's not there's nothing like simple-minded about it. That's one of the reasons why we work um, the, the First Amendment standards into it because First Amendment has all sorts of ways of dealing with this. But I and and, and by the way, I don't actually have to go to a theoretical case. Um, mm -hmm. There's Elizabeth Gurley Flynn at the ACLU in the 1950s. And I read all this stuff that, it's kind of funny, like reading stuff about the Red Scare from people who 
never took Stalin uh, as a threat seriously. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Russian-American, and I'm like, great, he's one of the greatest murderers of all time, and you, you don't take this seriously. And there really were American and British spies who were helping super Hitler, as we call him in my family, get the bomb. Um, <laughs> you know, just, just an abs So there was reason to be freaked out, people. Um, but there was someone who was on the board of the ACLU named Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, and she was leadership at the Communist Party. Um, she, uh, she even defended them, I, I'm pretty sure, during the Nazi pact um, with Stalin. Um, there's plenty of evidence that the leadership of the CP was filtering information to Stalin. And now, when you read stuff about the decision of the ACLU to kick her off the board during the Red Scare as being like, oh, it's a shameful moment for the ACLU, I'm like, they're the American Civil Liberties Union, and they had someone on there who was pro-totalitarian monster dictatorship. There is nobody who was worse in the world for civil liberties. If I found out that, like, I had someone on my team who was, who was pro-fascist, to be like, you don't freaking belong here. Uh, it's funny because um, if I found out someone worked for me, I so I, I'm gonna, I'm trying to ask devil's advocate questions, but sure. I, I I'm. I'm so with you. If I found out that someone who worked for me was a Nazi sympathizer, yeah, I I would do nothing. Wow. I, I, I would I would say as long as he doesn't bring it to work. Yeah. I would just say, well, well listen, what am I going to do about it? You know, like like. Well, let me let me. What I've noticed over time, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, is that a lot of people say things, and it doesn't necessarily represent how they behave in real life. And I've yeah. never really been able to come to groups with it. If, if, you know, I have a lot of Egyptians and Arabic people who work for me in the kitchen. I guarantee you they're sympathetic, or many of them are sympathetic, to much of the stuff that we're hearing to defend Hamas. That's the way they're raised. I, I could go further. I told a story recently. We had a guy years ago who was a manager. I don't want to say his name because I'm still in touch with him. And he believed openly most of... The jihadi type stuff. He believed that as Jews, my father and I would spend the afterlife burning as if we were one mile from the sun. He believed that the Mossad did all sorts of horrible things to corrupt Egyptian women. All of it. And yet, he dedicated with all his heart his career to my father's business, he worried about him. He was kind to me. He found out one time that I was in Egypt and hadn't told him. He had his family track me down at every hotel in Cairo, bring me to a feast, take me on a tour. He still keeps in touch with me this day. There's, it's a total contradiction, total cognitive dissonance. Yeah. So what am I supposed to react to? The fact that he has these beliefs that he's in some sense, parroting, or maybe that's being too kind to him, that he believes. Yeah. Or the guy who, with all his heart, has been nothing but one of the kindest, most dedicated people to me and my family. So, so I, I think about that. And I also know a guy who was uh, in the throes of this um, black Israelite stuff. Oh, wow. Who believes that white guys are this and the devil and blah, maybe invented by aliens. I don't know. And yet, I know that were I in trouble... Even physical trouble, this would be one of the first guys in my life who would drop everything and come to my aid. I've seen this over and over. So I, I, that also informs my thinking about this stuff. Like just because somebody says something, that's not the end of the matter. Yeah, I don't know how you feel about that. No, I think that that's a refreshingly sophisticated way to think about this stuff that has fallen out of favor. That essentially the idea that, and we talk about this in the book, we, um, in Coddling the American Mind, we talk about there being three great untruths, like basically terrible advice and, and things that you could believe that will ruin your life and make you unhappy. And in this one, we add a fourth great untruth um, that, that plays a lot into the way we argue today in the United States, which is that no bad person can have any good opinion. Um, and by the way, every damn put in parentheses, and by the way, everyone's arguably bad. Because so much of the way our discourse is, and it's been informed by K through 12, higher education, but also social media and Tumblr and all, all these unhealthy ways of arguing, is the rule seems to be, if I can prove you're a bad person, that means I don't have to listen to you anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something profoundly childish about that. Because you look at history, like, I mean, like, like Rousseau, horrible person. 
absolutely horrible person. Like he, he had like six, uh, like six children uh, with his mistress, uh, and he gave them all away for adoption. Meanwhile, writing about the uh, wonders of being uh, about of, of t the, the wonders of children. Uh, you know, Karl Marx, <laughs> horrible racist. Um, you know, uh, horrible anti-Semite. Um, that doesn't mean that they're wrong about everything, you know. Um, and I think, like the, the, on, on the left, kind of like they tend not to examine those two people who, who had horrible points of view. They tend to go to like David Hume, who's one of my favorite thinkers of all time. Um, but because he actually wrote a racist footnote in I think 1752, which is like okay, 1752, you know, like uh, he, he we know people were racist back then. He wrote a footnote, like that doesn't mean that his ideas are not profound, and we're still uh, we're still uh, you know have to engage with them uh, to this day. Uh, but yeah, we have this way of arguing of basically kind of like if I can find something one bad thing about you. I can, I no longer have to listen to you. And isn't that convenient? Because we're looking for constant excuses to not actually have to engage with people who disagree with us. And that's why in the book, we talk about the perfect rhetorical fortress on the left, the efficient rhetorical fortress on the right. And cancel culture, we try to get people to get that cancel culture is just the meanest, most extreme version of a larger approach to win arguments without actually winning arguments. That essentially, it, rather than engage with you and try to persuade you, I scare you to death. I, may, I, I bring up things you wrote 20 years ago to try to get you fired. I make sure that everyone knows that if someone takes this position again, we're coming for you. Um, so, but the, the, the extra level of deep pluralism that you're showing, like appreciation for a society in which, wait a second, this person believes in their heart of hearts, horrible things. And as best I can tell, you know, for example, they're still a great professor. That's the end of the analysis for me. You know, like mm -hmm. the, the um, I, this, I remember having a friend, um, from San Francisco, like flip out at me, um, because we were defending a, um, uh, like a creationist who was a physics teacher. Um, and that's all he read. Like he did, he read like the first two lines. Uh, and if he read and he got really mad at me, but if you read down, it's like, there is no reports that he ever let his creationist views interfere with his physics teaching. He's excellent reports as a teacher. I'm like, that's, that's what the analysis. And by the way, Isaac Newton was a, you know, like was a creationist. Like basically like when you look at the history of science, there's lots of people who believed in mystical things, but also could still be great scientists. So I, I wish everybody in, in this uh, thought this way about you, that, that, good, that even good people can have some horrible beliefs. And actually historically, you know, when we look back at this period, we're gonna, you always end up thinking that lots of people, maybe most people had horrible beliefs by the judgment of this time, but they weren't necessarily bad people. So you talk, you talk before about the, um, you want to um, essentially have the social norm align with First Amendment law, correct? Is that a... It, it not. I would say that the, the First Amendment law is good at informing what we should do in particular circumstances, but because it's a cultural norm, and a lot of my lawyer friends have a really hard time with the argument of culture of free speech, and the argument seems to be the the worst argument against this. By the way, is actually someone saying, "Well, that's the uh, the the right uses the term cancel culture, so you're engaged in political, you know, you're playing into their game." And I'm like. That's making the argument that, in your opinion, bad people make this argument too, and I'm not going to be bound by something that's silly. Um, but uh, they also, lawyers in particular, have a hard time with the idea of it being like, yeah, but what are what are the precise parameters? When do you when do you know exactly when you can fire someone and when you can't? And I'm like. I hate to break it to you, dude, but it's cultural. Like all culture ever is, is a series of of, of weighing and, and values. So our larger goal here is that one, you can use some of the principles in First Amendment law to help you know, make your thinking better about these things. So for example, if you're trying to f fire somebody um, and it turns out that they threaten someone's life, you know, it's like, that's not even protected under the law. Like, so, so like, don't, don't even worry about that. Or someone engages in a, you know, a, a pattern of harassing behavior uh, towards, uh, towards employees. Also, not, not really a hard call. Uh, defamation, all of these things that aren't. So by having the First Amendment in there, we introduce a lot of nuance to the analysis. But what we're trying to say more than anything else is we'd be in a much healthier country if rather than you know, push uh, Jennifer Say out of Levi's jeans because she, she argued that lockdowns will hurt uh, the most disadvantaged kids um, the most, uh, which ended up, of course, tr uh, proving to be true. 
Levi's also, even if they thought she was dead wrong on that, which clear, clearly they did, and she wasn't, of course, ultimately. We talk about her case in the book. That there should have been a thumb on the scale for everyone's entitled to their opinion. Is that going to overcome someone who, you know, shows themselves to be completely insane? No. Um, but might it actually uh, help in these situations where people are being fired for, you know, retweeting a joke on Twitter? You know, you know if, the, if the social norm or societal norm was, was sufficiently respected, we could even have people, people saying insane things. Like, uh, and lawyers should be able to understand this. It, um, we let people go who we know have murdered multiple people at once yeah. if the evidence has been gathered uh, illegally. Yeah. This is, and, and we live with that for the greater good of the system. And yeah. that is at least as hard to accept. You'd think there'd be some exception, you know, for, for murder, even in the exclusionary rule, but there's not. Yeah. So what's so hard about living knowing that somebody says something ridiculous in, 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 in the service of a society that's best able to live amicably with each other, best able to pursue truth and find truth? The, the 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 benefits are so enormous to just sucking it up sometimes. Yeah, I'm surprised that people can't see that. You know, in the law they say better to let um, uh, one a hundred guilty men go free than one innocent man go yeah. to jail. Same thing with ideas, right? Better yeah. to let a hundred dumb idea than one than one good idea get stepped on and we're, we're stepping on good ideas all the time just in the last few years with COVID and this and that we've seen so many things that were you know uh squelched come back around to have been true yeah because we didn't have this societal norm of letting people spout off what appeared to be maybe at the time as being untrue yeah. I don't know. Well, well, that's something that I have a somewhat different theory on uh, freedom of speech um, than most First Amendment lawyers, and I call it the pure informational theory of freedom of speech. If I'm being fancy, I call it the lab and the looking glass. Oh, that's and nice. and um, basically, it's more or less the argument going, coming from humanism that essentially, if the product, if the if the project of humanism is to know the world as it is and to continue to constantly push the boundaries of what we can know then there's something really basic you always need to know about the society in which you live in. And that's what people actually think and why. You can't get even slightly close to understanding of the world without that crucial information. But uh, partially because of some bad arguments on campus, we, we, we've constructed this really narrow kind of idea, the marketplace of ideas I, I think thing, where basically like, it seems like the argument has become, it's like, oh, that's a bad idea, and, there, and uh, falsity doesn't get any protection, so therefore it's, it's, not, not a, it's not very well thought out, but it's politically convenient in a lot of cases. And like the way I put it is, no, the world is not run by lizard people who live under the Denver airport. <laughs> um, but knowing that your uncle or your boyfriend or your girlfriend think that the world is run by lizard people who, who live under the Den Denver airport is really important information to know. Conspiracy theories matter not because they're true, but because they change the world. So I see a lot of what I consider to be primitive thinking around the value of freedom of speech and a lot of sort of ways to really just get back to this very fundamental and unfortunate human instincts that when you hear something that really bugs you and someone has an opinion that really gets under your skin to ostracize them, to otherwise figure out a way to get rid of them, and historically to respond with violence uh, to, uh, to, uh, to that person. So I think we're constantly, this is why my sub stack is called the eternally radical idea, because I think in every generation free speech is a radical idea because in every generation uh, people stand up to oppose freedom of speech, <laughs> and like reliably. And they're usually on the winning side. And there's a lot of our natural instincts that actually incline us towards that. It's much harder, but it's much wiser to take seriously the possibility you might be wrong, keep an open mind, play with ideas even if they offend you. Because like the value sometimes of, of that person who has that crazy thought is in the act of arguing against it, you're like, Actually, there's 15 other things I just thought about because I actually hadn't had yes. to think that one through before. The, the, even though that was wrong, these 15 things are actually really valuable. Yeah. Uh, if, so then if you were to – I'm sure you've thought about this. If you um, 
were to inherit Twitter from Elon Musk, uh, how would you run it? Would you? Would everything go? Would there be any limitations? I think the I, I would be informed by the First Amendment uh, for sure. I think that the I think one place where I'm more of a hawk on actually punishing people, um, which might surprise you, but um, is true threats. I, I think that we have undermined people's faith in freedom of speech by the mistaken belief that true threats are protected because there are times when people on Twitter uh, say things that are clearly saying, I'm, you know, I'm coming to your home and I'm fucking killing you. Sorry. Um, I, I, That's all right. It's a, it's a family show. Free speech. Free speech. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, that, that, that should actually be, you know, investigated and, uh, when, when that comes up, because otherwise it makes people think that, oh, wow, that, that's protected too. It's like, no, actually it's not. Um, however, this is something that we emphasize a lot in the book, arguing towards truth. So there's a lot of what we're saying in the book um, that's about free speech. And there's also a lot that's about how you actually produce knowledge. Um, and we're really clear that if you go through the perfect rhetorical fortress, you know, for example, which is the sort of like way you avoid arguments on the left, that includes things like, first of all, if I can label you conservative, I don't have to listen to you anymore. It doesn't matter if you are, you know, um, I can just label you it. And, and I know this from experience. I did the same thing when I was in law school that I, you know, I didn't even, I barely even realized I was doing it. Like if you could label, like I didn't have to read Thomas Sowell because he was a right winger. I didn't have to read Camille Paglia because I was told she was a right winger, which I found in retrospect is insane. And I'm, an, <laughs> I'm, and I'm ashamed of this, but this is still very much the, 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 you know, something that exists on the left. Also, you know, on the right, calling someone woke, even if they're, you know, pretty conservative is a good way to like avoid an argument. But the PRF goes down this, and we call it perfect because it's just layer after layer after layer of not having to listen to uh, people. And we take people down the demographic funnel, you know, what's your color, what's your gender, what's your sexuality, what's your gender identity. And we get down to, if you follow it all the way down the rabbit hole, you get to about 0.9% of the population of, of, of the of the country um, are none of those things. So you've automatically eliminated 99.1% of the people you should be debating with. Of course, you can go further down on expertise and all these other ways to dismiss people. But here's the trick at the end. It turns out that if you have the wrong opinion at the end of this exhausting process by which the clock has already been run out, uh, you are still considered, you are still dismissed. So Coleman Hughes, your, our mutual friend, has a great quote in there saying, I am constantly being told that the color of my skin is the most important thing about the, how seriously my opinion on any number of topics should be taken. But then when I actually say my opinion and people don't like it, I get told I'm not really black. Yeah. And I heard this from John McWhorter, uh, Wilson, uh, Wilford Riley, etc. So what am I getting at about what I would do with Twitter? I think if there was, and I said this on the Lex Friedman podcast too, and I, I don't think this would be impossible to do. I don't want there to not be Twitter for people, you know, engaging in cancel culture and cat jokes. I want that to exist. I want people, you know, to tell it like cracking jokes or following sports or music or whatever. I would love there to be like a stream within Twitter that's about actually debating ideas with rules. Um, that involve and where you can somehow maybe upvote or downvote when people are like, oh, 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 that's a straw man. Oh, 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 that's that's an ad hominem, it, because we are wasting so much IQ, so and so much time on canceling each other and just figuring out ways to win arguments without winning arguments about getting one over on the other side, whereas we could actually be fixing things. So I, I talked a little bit about how it could be done to because yeah and to if you let me expand on this a little bit um one of the analogies i make to today to to really get people to understand how unique this historical moment is is remember i mentioned i studied the printing press yeah. the printing press was incredibly disruptive to the entire world um and actually i think by the if you were looking at it from the point of view of 1521 you'd be saying this thing wasn't worth it it just led to bloodshed and witch trials and blah 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 but over time because it allowed so many more people into the global conversation, it became this, well, that's the reason why it was so disruptive in the first place, but it ultimately led to disconfirmation. It led to the, all these many eyes on problems going like, that's false, that's false, that's false, which was a huge you know, boon for, for humanity. Social media is a billion additional people 
um, in in the conversation. There's literally no way that can't be disruptive. But and we're st- and we're at that stage where it's just disruptive, where it can just tear down. But I don't entirely. I haven't entirely lost hope that. By the way, if we have that many people being a little more disciplined, but looking at problems and took the rules of actually how you get to truth or at least how you get away from falsity seriously, we can actually solve stuff possibly faster than we ever have in human history. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I have a couple of thoughts. First of all, when I, when I see anti-Semitism on Twitter, my instinct is not that they should get rid of it. I'm happy to be able to see it, so I, and I'm happy to be able to show it to my kids so that they understand that it's out there. At the same time, I don't want them, you know, they're, they're like anybody else, unable to parse it. They see something on Twitter. They can't really gauge from that how, what percentage of the world is like that. It could just be a bunch of crazy people on Twitter. But there's also something in the way that, like at the comedian table at the cellar, which I'm kind of the arbiter of last resort, <laughs> I would allow any conversation of any issue so but i would not allow personal attacks so for instance even in front of a trans comedian i would not protect she or he from her uh, a conversation where somebody is um has an opinion about gender affirming care or sports or, any, or anything trans or even whether it's mental illness whatever they want to talk about i'm like well this is this is what people are talking about i can't protect you from that yeah but if a comedian then turned to the trans person trans person and then purposely misgendered her i'd be like get the fuck out of here you you you're out of this conversation and even if they misgendered her behind her back at the table i would boot them from the table because to me, there's a bright line there between discussing issues and bullying somebody. I don't quite know how to make that standard written to, for Twitter to implement, but I, there is a difference there. So I would let anybody say anything they want about the Jews, including consp- whatever it is. I, you know, let, let them talk about whatever they think is true about the Jews. Mm-hmm. But I would not let somebody answer somebody, you fucking kike, blah, blah, blah. I say, no, that's not okay. Is, is that reasonable? I think that... It's one of the reasons why I want this to be a stream within Twitter. I, I don't mm-hmm. want to go like to the point where people being insulting to each other, you know, like and even highly insulting to, to individuals, uh, would be something that would get you uh, kicked off Twitter. Um, partially because I think that standard is too slippery and too subjective. It is slippery, yeah. But it's okay when I do it, but I wouldn't let someone else do it. <laughs> well, and you have, you have every right to. And if, like, if you're trying to have a good discussion, you know, yes. you're right. Uh, but I do think within this idea of the stream of having th- th- that you would no longer be allowed in the discussion screen stream if you can't uh, play by the rules. You just move back to regular Twitter. You're outside mm-hmm. of the actual you know world of ideas stream that's actually trying to fix things. You you know go back to your cat videos or your or your friends and you know t- talk your smack. But this is actually a serious place where we're trying to have an argument. To a degree, that's what higher education is and was supposed to be unfortunately it's doing a god-awful job at a, of, of it at the moment all right so uh have you have you must have access to elon musk somehow have you have you tried to get with him to give him your suggestions i'm sure he's looking for good good ideas you know i i, I said it on the lex friedman podcast i i sent him a letter when he took over um when he took over twitter uh, about you know offering to talk about some of the stuff um, you know I'd be I'd be delighted to contribute to it. I'm also working with another company called Integrally about trying to create a social media platform specifically for you know arguing towards truth. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean if if you wanted to pick my brain, uh, I would be. Oh, actually, that sounds very presumptuous. If you if you wanted to uh, pick my comparatively yeah. tiny little brain, um, <laughs> the uh, I'd, I'd be happy to chat with him. Do you think he's doing a a good job, bad job? It's mixed, you know. Like it's, I, I, I want to put you on the spot. So say something insulting about him as you want to pick. The, <laughs> no, sure. I'm kidding. I don't want to put you. I'm saying I, I I put you kind of on the spot after just saying maybe you'd want to well, speak I, with him, but I, I, he I, can take he can I, take it. I I, I I can tell you one thing that actually gave me better appreciation for old Twitter um, that uh, I, I didn't know they deserved on this one. Um, some of the uh, attacks on free speech that are coming out of India, for example, um, it, uh, Musk has a rule of listen, free speech, but we have to abide by local law. Which you know, with my lawyer hat on, it's like, yeah, I guess you don't really have much of a choice in that. But then discovering that in previous cases, when um, 
uh, Modi had tried to get people to, uh, you know, or his government tried to get speech removed from Twitter, the previous administration fought. Like, they're basically like, no, we're not going to do that. And I think at least in part because they've so stripped down um, the size of the company, which certainly comes with some benefits for sure. Uh, they, in one of the most recent examples, didn't. And, and you know, we, we were critical of him for that, for example. Well, someone else might say he's that's a, it's convenient for him because – he has his car company and China to 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 mesh together, and this is a easy way to concede to China what local law is. I, I'm not saying that's the case, but it's certainly something that would come to mind. Yeah, well, that, that, and actually, this is a good opportunity for me to do a shout out for uh, my colleague Sarah McLaughlin, who's doing a book. I'm not sure; we don't know yet when it's coming out, but it's about how. China directly threatens freedom of speech in the United States, particularly on campus, um, and about horrifying stories about people, you know, if they say something that the Chinese government doesn't like and, and they're studying in the United States, they can find out that their parents have been arrested. You know, like it, it's a it's it's worse than you think about, like, how much China it harms, you know, uh, even free speech in the United States uh, in a variety of ways. All right. So now how does this all apply? I'm. I'm- Pretty sure I can predict your views, but I don't want to assume. Um, these young adults who have had job offers rescinded or actually been fired because they expressed sympathy for uh, the activities of Hamas, yeah. they signed statements. How do you feel about all that? How do I feel about it as opposed to what do I think about it? Kind of Both, different. however you want, however you, you know, whatever, however you want to engage with it. I think if you're putting, if you're making a blacklist of saying don't hire these people for their political speech on campus, that's an issue for me. Um, like I think that fits within my definition of cancel culture. I do, however, also make the lab in the looking glass argument that keep in mind it's valuable to know what people really think, and if you spent the last ten days horrified to learn how anti-Semitic many of these campuses has become, there's real value in that. Because, yeah, I, I remember going to, like, Berkeley, like, 10 years ago and just being like, oh, oh, wow, some of these people are not anti-Zionist. They are anti-Semitic. Um, and and it, that, that fact has gotten much, much worse. So there's a value in knowing that. And I want to be really clear here. One of the things that actually created an environment like that is cancel culture itself. Because right now, university presidents, um, and you know, m m uh, many of whom I know, are sympathetic to Israel, um, are, uh, were horrified by the Hamas attacks, were afraid to say that publicly because they were afraid of their own activist professors, students, and administrators canceling them or trying or making their lives difficult or taking over the president's office, etc. So if there like so there's been some donor pressure on some universities to say something about this. Now I generally think universities shouldn't be doing political statements to begin with, but for people saying they've done it on everything else. It's unforgivable that on something this monstrous, they're not actually going to say well, it. Well, like, at, at this point, to stay quiet is a political statement, given the context bingo. of everything else. Right? You know, agreed. So, so even though ultimately FIRE supports the Calvin Report, political neutrality, everyone's saying that it's kind of like, no, they're just hiding on this one. So cancel culture is enough to scare presidents into saying not what they really think. And some of these donors aren't saying, change your opinion on this. They're saying... Say what you really think, you cowards, and, 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 and I get that. Meanwhile, for Harvard, one of the reasons why you could have these Harvard students think that coming out pro Hamas and saying that Israel had this entirely coming was something that there wouldn't be massive blowback against is in part because everyone was too afraid to disagree with them because like that's actually something that can get you canceled on campus. And fire, by the way, we have defended Palestinian speech all the time, Israeli speech all the time. We are completely not nonpartisan on this stuff. But the um, the certainty, because it is, it has become a situation where anything other than sort of like the Palestinian side of the argument um, on some of these particularly elite campuses is kind of treated in semi, semi blasphemously. So I think that in some ways I have some sympathy for some of these students because it's like, well, this is just what I've been told since, you know, K through 12 on up that anything that happens in the Middle East is Israel's fault. Um, and everyone seems to agree with me. Like what, what just, what just happened? So when it comes to, um, it was nice to see Vivek Ramaswamy also coming out and saying that he, he thinks that the blacklists are, are, are are bad. Um, but again, when you're making a culture of free speech argument, the best you can do is, you know, put the thumb on the scale of 
uh, freedom of speech, you know, for even for people you don't like. I do have one caveat, though. Um, in the book and in my experience, and this happened tons of times after Coddling the American Mind came out, employers will write us and say, me and Height, or call us sometimes on, the, um, on our cell phones, saying, oh, wow, these new employees, they cannot handle anyone disagreeing with them. They want to get the IT guy uh, uh, fired because it turns out our great IT guy is actually kind of Republican. They want to get, they want to cancel anybody who disagrees with them. Um, and it's a disaster and I'm not hiring from elite colleges anymore or sometimes they name a particular college they're not gonna hire from anymore. And my response is always, okay, great. Tell the world that. Tell them that, that your big fancy company that I cannot name um, is refusing to hire from the Ivy Leagues. And they're like, no, 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 that would be too, that, 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 that would give us too much blowback. And I'm like, okay, so quietly the, uh, this is happening. If I had a situation where uh, I think that actually, frankly, one, if um, elite higher education mattered less in all of our lives, that would be really good for the country. I think that instead of, like, part of the problem is Goldman Sachs thinks it has to hire from some of these schools, and it's like, you can find a lot of geniuses at Ohio State, thank you very much. Um, like, you can find some really brilliant people at other schools, and they're not going to come with the same kind of political certainty. I also think that when they're hiring from elite colleges, they got to make sure they're not hiring cancelers. They're not h hiring the kind of people who will make their lives hell um, for anybody who politically disagrees. So, you know, if, if I was hiring from a, a, an elite school, of course, if they're coming to fire, it'd be different. But let's say I, I ran a, a regular corporation. The main thing I'd want to find from elite college graduate is, can you work with someone who thinks biological sex is real? <laughs> can you work with someone who actually thinks your opinion on Hamas is repugnant? Um, and I'm sure that they'd be smart enough not to say, um, I couldn't, but it, watch how they react. And because you don't want to hire someone who's going to show up and act like a typical elite uh, student, and they don't get how typical they're being. The way elite student graduates have been from, uh, you know, fancy finishing schools going back a century, they think they're intellectually superior and they think they're morally superior. And if you sh and if they show up actually saying it's my way or the highway when it comes to the political points of view of this um, uh, of this place, you better you know you. Should should look for someone from Indiana State University instead. I agree with <clears throat> so many things that you just said. And, you know, one thing with these college kids is that they still have one foot in, in teenage years even. They're, they're at an age where they're, they're the most naive, the most full of themselves, the most susceptible to peer pressure. And the universities have have allowed them to be marinated in, I don't want to call it nonsense, but just one side of these issues such that to, and Coleman told me this about Columbia, to, to uh, outwardly express sympathy for Israel is an act of tremendous bravery. Yeah. It means you're going to be shunned. It means you're going to be identified. and it means you might never date again. <laughs> might, and, 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 that's right. And teenagers... Buckle at this. There is there is Stockholm syndrome in other contexts. This probably, in some way, applies to this kind of dynamic as well. And firing these kids, no. You need to figure out what the hell is going on at these universities. Fire the people who who taught the kids. They're just saying what it is they learned in school. It's absurd to fire people for saying out loud what they were taught is the, the, the correct position in school. But then there's another matter that the social norm is so important because as a commercial enterprise, which a law firm is, you have clients. Sure. And if clients have the expectation that you shouldn't be hiring these people, uh, you know, I mean, I would like to think that some law firms would say, fuck you, I'm going to hire them anyway. But they don't have to do that. People have families to feed. I, you know, I, I get it that they might say, I, I can't. I, I can't lose my clients over this. So the, the social norm is required. So people can say, what are you, backwards? We know, you know we don't fire people because they have views you don't agree with. And there was a time that... I don't know if everybody felt that way, but that was much more common. Like, what are you talking about? So what? 
this is not. Yeah. You know, this is a contracts case. Who cares that, what this person thinks that about That time it? was like 13 years ago, you know, yeah. when, when, when people got this better. Ooh, I realize we don't have too much time left. But, That's um, okay. What, one thing that I wanted to really get in here is that mm -hmm. there's big donor moves to against um, higher ed because they're just disgusted with how, how they handle they're handling the current situation. Uh, what worries me is it seems like the big donor moves are like, okay, you said something on everything else, say something con condemning a Hamas. And I'm like, okay, that's small potatoes. You, you're free to make that argument, sure. But please get that higher education, particularly elite higher education, has profound problems. This is a symptom of a much, much larger problem. So if you're going to be using your money, use it to... I think actually the first thing, how much, pro how many problems have been created on campus by very wealthy people just giving out of habit to schools, um, the, 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 to, to their alma maters, massive, writing massive checks to them without saying, okay, how many administrators do you have? Do they police speech? Are they, are they the people in some cases not preventing or in some cases organizing the shutdowns? And by the way, some, oftentimes they are, yeah. um, that are actually, you know, uh, 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 getting a campaign against, say, Carol Hooven at Harvard, you know, started with a DEI administrator. There are DEI administrators like in the audience um, when, uh, Nicholas and Eric, uh, when Nicholas Christakis, uh, during that shout down. We, we've seen, um, of course, the DEI administrator was part of what, what happened at, at my alma mater, Stanford, um, that they should be, there should be investigation every single time there's a shout down to figure out, did, the, did any administrators do anything to stop this? And more importantly, did they do anything to encourage this? Because this is actually creating an environment where you can't have a marketplace of ideas. So they should be demanding freedom of speech. They should be defending, uh, explaining to people, actually having a part of orientation about how to actually like, di uh, how, how to actually hear people out for one thing and how to actually have, you know, discussions across lines of difference. They should be eliminating administrators who are enforcing political orthodoxies. They should be, you know, figuring out if, if professors are doing the same thing, but so there's massive reform opportunity, and I'm and I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to figure out how to do it. I wrote something uh, just got rejected from the Wall Street Journal, basically exactly on this, what, which I would really like to find a home for. But at the same time, possibly the most important thing they could do is say, "Listen, buddy, I'm not writing you the massive check this year. I might never ma write that check again. I'm going to write it at the University of Austin, uh, the, the University of Austin, Texas. Like, not not UT Austin, but like the, the experiment that Pano Canales is doing. Or I'm going to write it to Minerva University in Chicago, uh, in San Francisco, that really is trying to be like a cutting edge school. Um, <laughs> or I'm going to write it to Fire to help with their campus free speech rankings. Uh, or I'm going to start an entirely new project that actually does a better job of telling me who the hardest working, best, and brightest kids are. The the ones who you know weren't the kids of legacies um, at, at Harvard who actually are the best you know, readers and thinkers and hardest working. I think that n it would be squandering an opportunity uh, to just focus on this incident, to not actually realize that there's no way you have a situation like you had in the past 10 days on college campuses without the rot being really, really deep. Yeah. Um, uh, I know you do that list. If, if if your kids were applying to college, what would be the three schools, the sweet spot of getting everything you want for them academically while at the same time uh, the best atmosphere for um, free speech? What are the top three colleges, would you say? Well, I live in D.C., so definitely on the top of my list would be University of Virginia. University of Virginia um, finished... Um, uh, in the top ten this year, mm -hmm. and they actually do walk a good, you know, t t t t uh, talk a good game, and actually walk the walk on on free speech. And and our and I really want people to understand our campus free speech rankings. Is, it, it, they're very very rigorous. They're based on like thirteen different factors. It's the largest study of student opinion on whether or not they can t talk on campus ever done. It relies on the four largest uh, databases of professor cancellation, student cancellations, deplatforming, and speech codes. Um, Harvard, by the way, I, um, uh, earned its position as dead last this year. I, I got a little irritated when people were trying to say, oh, it's like a, well, I mean, that's going to get you a lot of attention. And it's like, no, that's where they fell. We don't put a thumb on the scale for it. Um, like I, and by the way, it seems like you haven't noticed that Harvard is always in the bottom. Just the difference here is when you factored in, you know, professor cancellations, for example, they were dead last instead of in the bottom 10. 
Um, but when it comes, so yeah, Uni University of Virginia is a good one. Purdue uh, is, is a good one. University of Chicago, um, you know, they, they went from first place to 13th because of a, what we thought was a, a badly handled case involving a, a chapter of the conservative Turning Point USA. But overall, I don't balk at the idea that they're they're excellent at that. So those are three of the three of the top schools. Living in DC, you know, George uh, George Washington does not very well. I think they're like 180 something out of 240. Uh, Georgetown is third from the bottom. The the, the oh, bottom yeah. is Harvard, Penn, Georgetown, University of South Carolina. And and that's the thing about kind of like if you really think that the like the if you really look at the numbers, you can actually, you know, see why everybody ended up in their in their various spots. But yeah, so I, I th those are uh, the schools I'd recommend probably the most are University of Chicago, UVA, Purdue, uh, and, and a couple others. What about George Mason? You know, all these all these really iconoclastic heterodox people like Tyler Cowen and Brian Cappell work George Mason. But then I I saw something in the news about something at George Mason the last couple of days. I don't remember what it was, but maybe you remember what it was. Is that do you I wish I remembered off the top of my head where Mason landed, but it wasn't as good as I, I would have hoped. And I, and I taught First Amendment at, at George Mason as well, but we, we, we've had some disappointing cases over there. I, they're certainly not the worst, um, but I would have hoped they were better. All right, so um, before we go, um, uh, tell us about, just for fun, and include the porn star, what are, what are some of the, like, the, the best... Uh, examples of cancel culture at work to really get people riled up and want to leave this interview and go buy your book what's give us a few what's the porn star example uh well nico told me that there's a porn star mia khalifa who was denounced and deplatformed oh, yeah that, you, yep. that i should ask you about that yeah that that case is actually it, it's so it's playboy decided to fire mia khalifa who does porn for uh for playboy um because of her pro hamas you know uh statements you know obviously playboy can do that still you know ba basically i try to make the distinction like listen don't say this isn't cancel culture what your argument is is you think this person deserves being canceled but i can't help but find it kind of funny of being kind of like and therefore we're depriving you of naked pictures of her you know like it's like, it's like <laughs> I know. okay that's funny like like is that like uh, there's, there's a whole porn channel for pro-israel people who want to see the porn with, with pro-hamas people this is <laughs> well, like because like being angry at the person you're attracted to you know? yes like, yes like, it, 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 that, that like never my, happens. that's why my wife likes to have sex with me but go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of but in terms of cancel culture that we talk about in the book you know like we we go into psychotherapy we talk about it in medicine we talk about it in publishing and journalism i actually gotta say no, um, the thing that scares me the most was talking to people who are getting their degrees in, in psychotherapy and, and people are actually practicing out there and hearing stories about, you know, uh, young psychotherapists, clinical psychologists being taught that if your, um, you know, patient says something that, uh, you know, isn't PC, essentially, that you should intervene to correct them. And I'm like, it's, I it's was suicidally depressed in 2007. I had to be hospitalized as a danger to myself. One of the things that got me depressed was the culture war um, and being in this awful situation where the left hated me when I defended the right and the right hated me when I defended the left. And I didn't seem to be around other than my, my, my work colleagues, people principled enough to understand that. Um, and so if I, I was seeing a shrink uh, like during that period and if my shrink had decided to intervene to correct uh my offensive points of view i don't know if i'd be here and and so like as far as like a chapter that that uh we had to you know we wrote this relatively quickly but we still cover an awful awful lot of ground in the book um including data uh, in, in, including i, I mean the, the data in there I, I, i'm so proud of my research team and how much we were able to find to just prove this is real it's on a historic scale people this isn't subtle um but also uh you know the psychotherapy chapter is something that should and can be uh, you know, blown up into its own book actually i think there is i think critical therapy i think i should i think there is actually a book out there but that that i need to read but that that was the one that disgusted me the most 
All right. I think this has been a great interview. I, I, there's one other thing that's fascinating about you and uh, because I have other people in my life that uh, this pertains to is that you, you're you also um, – I, I, I don't think I'm spilling the beans. I'm pretty sure you've spoken about this. You're also dyslexic, correct? I, I am, yeah. No, it, it's 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 funny. Um, the I don't talk about that too – uh, too much because then I start sounding. I remember mentioning this to Height, and it's kind of like, "So you're my depressed co-author, the guy with, you know, who had the tumor, which is why, like, I have a titanium plate in my face." I, um, you know, grow up. Like, I start sounding like too much like a sad sack about like all all, all the problems that I have. But I'm dyslexic. Um, it meant that when I was a until you're about sixth grade, it really sucks to be dyslexic because most of the things you're learning, like you're, the processing issue. Um, but one thing I will say that's incredibly helpful is it teaches you to be a delegator, which is one of the reasons why dyslexics are disproportionately business leaders, in my opinion. It gets you all sorts of good habits. It makes you a great audio learner, which I absolutely am. Um, but most importantly, it gives you a tremendous amount of humility because I spent – I just thought I was dumb, and but weirdly good at a bunch of things, but dumb otherwise. And knowing that you're not that great at, at something – is so important for a manager to understand because everybody's not that great at something. Just some people who are you know, generally highly capable think that they're equally good at all things. And knowing that you're not that great at things opens up all of these, you know, uh, curiosity, humility, all of these kind of things that can be hard for other people, knowing that at some level you're profoundly stupid, is a good way to check yourself, to, to, to remember that in the grand scheme of things you really – all of us know, know, know very little. So I actually think dyslexia, although being a big pain um, when I was a kid, has been something that has enriched and improved my life in a variety of ways. Well, that's a really profound point. My father described to me many times, not he wasn't dyslexic, but I think because he immigrated at a particular age and had trouble with the language, that he grew up thinking he was not smart. And he was very, very smart. But that always stayed with him, and I think I, I, I recognize exactly what you're saying. He always had this humility, humility about him that very well could have come from not believing in, in not having confidence in his own intelligence for his formative years. And the opposite side, the people at Harvard, <laughs> these are the kids who have always been told they were geniuses, mm -hmm. right? That's how they got into Harvard, or, or the overwhelming majority of them. And that would then predict a tremendous lack of humility. Yeah. Which and would explain, yeah. And meanwhile, you know, get, getting to, uh, like, I joke that I got, I was a scholarship student for American University. And if you already have a class chip on your shoulder, it was kind of the worst place I could go because it, it was a school where the other scholarship students were hardworking, smart, and virtuous, and the rich kids were dumb and mean. Um, but then I got to Stanford, and I always describe it as my first experience with decent, hard work, and rich folk. And I was kind of impressed, like like, like that uh, that n nobody who gets into law school, everybody has to be at least a hard worker at minimum, and all of them, almost all of them, are are, are very smart. Mm -hmm. um, but I did occasionally run into the fact, and actually this is something I never stopped presenting, um, is that. There were suddenly people who looked at me like I was a legitimate human being all of a sudden when they'd hear where I went to school. And that irked me. And that suddenly we're, we're in the elect of the smart people. And I'm like, you know who's smart? My buddy Anthony Rodriguez, who, who had every freaking job. You know, he was the other kid who was working with me, you know, but he was like shimmying up trees. Like I worked at Sabaros when we were 13. Uh, you know, he he's brilliant. And he went from, you know, not necessarily looking all that promising to now he's a professor for Providence College, which we both find very funny about like how we've actually ended up. I think uh, people in that environment can really underestimate how many freaking brilliant people will never get, never have any access or any ability to be in that environment and who could run circles around them. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I, I have some other stories, but uh, dealing with um, the parents of my, at the JCC, my children went to in Scarsdale when they didn't know who I was, and I would, I would say I own a restaurant, you know, so I don't want to, and, and they would s literally start speaking down to me, you know. And, Should I speak slower? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then a couple, and two times this happened where somebody said, oh, yeah, well, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, I went, I, and, I said, and I would say, oh, I went to law school too, actually. And then with 
I can't, we're just dripping at the mouth. I say, oh, really? Where did you go? And then I'll tell them where I went. I went to a good law school. And then they shut down because they weren't expecting that. And likely I went to a better law school than they went to. So they didn't even where, offer. Where did you where, go to law school? University of Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so second uh, from the bottom, though. <laughs> second, oh, <yeah. laughs> but great law school. <laughs> yeah, the law. Um, but just you know, you could see how much pleasure they were hoping to take in the fact of making me feel small. That's gross. Anyway, but that's human nature, right? Not anyway. Okay, listen, Greg, it's it's, uh, it's fantastic to reconnect with you and have Such you on fan, this though. show. Oh, I'm a huge fan of yours, and I'm uh, one of the pleasures of my life that began with starting this podcast is that I've been able to make friends with such amazingly interesting and, and nice and generous and um, I don't know what all the other adjectives I want to use, people like you. Mm. And um, it's, it's really, it's, it's an enormous pleasure in my life right now to be able to speak to people like you uh, and uh, have these kind of conversations. I wish my father were alive to see it because he would have, mm. he lived for that kind of thing. All right, uh, I'll, I'll get this out uh, as quickly as possible. Thanks, Noam. Take care.